Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the, I think it's the fifth episode of the OKNY podcast. Uh, our O oh, in the OKNY is absent today because he is doing overtime. Fun, fun. Uh, so it's just going to be me, Ichin, and uh, Kenny uh, talking about not uh, only fab stuff, but we want to kind of branch out into talking about a lot of concepts that apply to uh, game design in general, um, since that's kind of our, yeah. our passion. Yeah, absolutely. Both Eugene and I are much more interested in kind of the broader spectrum of design. So this will be a bit more um, of a look into those elements across games. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what we'll start with is a focus on uh, new player onboarding. So uh, I figured this is a good kickoff topic. Uh, what we'll focus on is specifically uh, how to get new players playing your game as both a designer and as a teacher. Uh, that's one of the issues that uh, Flesh and Blood has had, and honestly, any game that isn't one of the big three has had in uh, kind of capturing an audience and making sure that audience stays with it and learns the game the way you want it to be played and hopefully enjoys it. So Yeah, so I guess the, I was going to say to, to kick off with, why don't you talk a little bit about the issues that Flesh and Blood has had with this onboarding? Yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, one of the things I've noticed, especially with uh, teaching new, newer newer players is that obviously there's a price issue when you first start out with with fab but even before then uh, a lot of the concepts that are integral in fab don't really apply as much uh, as you know as when you're playing another card game uh, most of the card games that have kind of gotten some amount of popularity up until now have had some sort of uh, ramping up of resources while with Flesh and Blood, everything is ephemeral and everything is temporary. So a lot of the mindset that players approach it with, especially with deck building and with gameplay, might not apply. And uh, as a result, the game might seem a little shallow when you first start out. Uh, and it's up to the, the new player, or rather the teacher, to teach the player where that depth applies and where that sort of strategy applies in playing the game. Yeah, absolutely. That One of the key things that really differentiates Fab from the games, as you said, is that temporary board state, right? And that's actually why it's almost like a completely separate topic, but I really enjoy, um, you know, the, the classes that have that more, or that lean into that more temporary board state, whereas I don't enjoy the classes that have more, temp, uh, more permanent board states, things like Dash and Prism, as an example. But yes, one of the key things is just you can't generalize skills from other games as easily into Flesh and Blood mm -hmm. because the concepts are so different. Yeah, so I think as a, as a teacher, one of the things that you want to teach, first of all, is that you want to approach a card game with the mindset that uh, car concepts like card advantage and uh, value generation that might be present in other games uh, either look differently or are applied differently than they would in those other games. So that's one of the major hurdles that I see uh, Fab onboarding has uh, as a game. The other one, obviously, is getting players to try a new game in part in general, because they're not most people aren't willing to devote the the brain space to learning a new game if they've already been entrenched in one or two other games for a very long time. Yeah, and it's that real challenge between um, depth and complexity, right? And also just how you're going to keep people. Um, invested in the game. Mm -hmm. If a game is too deep, and this is something I have to wrestle with a lot, and that kind of be the beauty of it is not apparent straight up, then you, you're you very unlikely to capture players in the longer term. So you have to really try and make a game appealing up front and then have the staying power through its depth in order to keep those players on board. That's actually something I think that Flesh and Blood honestly does do reasonably well in the sense that um, the core concepts of the game are quite enjoyable even if you don't understand the depth too much. Yes. And it's quite, uh, it's quite easy to see uh, after you know, a couple of games where the depth and complexity of, the, of Flesh and Blood uh, comes into play, mostly in the planning aspect and uh, trying to eke out small incremental advantages using the tools at your disposal. But for a lot of players, uh, and for a lot of games in general, it's hard to hit that sweet spot where you can have a game that's easy to pick up but also... Players who play it can see, okay, this is where I can master the game, and this is where I can apply, you know, my brain power to really learn how the game plays and master it. Yeah, I think one, you know, it's that old adage, right? The the whole you want a game that's easy to learn, hard to master, right? Which mm -hmm. is the ideal. 
because you want the complexity barrier to learning the game to be low enough that people will give it a try and not be intimidated straight up. Um, but you also want the game to have enough staying power that the people who do pick it up actually want to stick around. One thing I was going to say with um, a few games and just things I've thought about in design generally is you also want that depth to be apparent very quickly. So if you have a game that doesn't seem to be very deep, even, even if it may be, then that perception is going to dry, drive people away from your game. As you mentioned with Flesh and Blood, while Flesh and Blood you can discover the, the depth after a few games, because it's subtle, you, it could go over people's heads in that sense. I don't mean that in a critical way to the player. I more mean that that depth is much more subtle than obvious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And as a, result, as a result of that, you know, people might just think that, oh, this is it, and then move on. So you, you simultaneously... You want people to be able to get into the game really easily and understand how to play it, but you also want to make it clear that there's more beneath the surface. Absolutely. And one of the biggest, I think, issues with uh, converting Flesh and Blood players to Magic, we're going to go a little bit off topic here, but I'll bring it back around, is that a lot of the surface level depth of Flesh and Blood seems to be very akin to the typical uh, burn versus like life gain strategies that you see sometimes in Magic that are extremely shallow because there's not too much depth in between them. So to a layman coming from a, from a Magic um, background, the game might seem very simple and very unappealing for those who don't enjoy that gameplay, which is a lot of people. Which is why uh, I think Flesh and Blood has had a lot of difficulty not capturing the professional level or competitive minded Magic players, but capturing the casual level Magic players who want to, you know, experiment and want to like see what kind of wild deck types there are. And then they see, oh, it's just burn versus life gain. Yeah, 100%. One thing I think that Flesh and Blood does have um, in its favor is the ability to um, for players to develop a bit of attachment to an identity in the game. Mm -hmm. Unlike a game like Magic, as, exa as an example, where you know, you've got colors and you know, people do attach their identity to a color somewhat. Like I consider myself to be mostly a blue player. Mm -hmm. um, well, not that I've played Magic in about 10 years or so, but <laughs> when I used to play. Um, but in Flesh and Blood you have the advantage of having these characters which people can really um, attach themselves to. It was similar in games like Game of Thrones, LCG, and Call of Cthulhu, where you could attach yourself to a faction, right? You know, playing House Stark, or in Star Wars, playing, uh, you know, the Sith or something like that. Yeah, or playing an no, identity Netrunner, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so being able to identify with something in the game is actually a really nice way to get people in, interested in the game. Yeah, it gives them something more concrete to latch onto. Yep, and that same uh, kind of identity that people kind of latched onto is the main reason why a commander, uh, in general, the commander, the commander of the format has grown so much in popularity over the years as a is now the primary way to play Magic because it gives players the ability to latch onto that identity. Yeah, absolutely. Like commander is just fantastic for that. I think the other thing as well is that commander being a much more casual format allows people to approach it in a more well, at least usually casual format. There's obviously some competitive commander events and that kind of thing, but mm -hmm. being able to build a deck around an identity is really fun and really exciting, and I think that's something that appeals to a lot of people. Exactly. And so I'll kind of segue you into our, new t uh, our next topic, which is uh, the main hurdles to new player onboarding. We covered one of them, which is you know having, having a immediate appeal that players can latch onto is an, is an important thing, uh, but we'll talk about some of the more mechanical things that we've seen games in general, board games, video games, all of those do or fail to do uh, in order to capture an audience and you know really have people sink their teeth into the game. So one of the first yeah. things, or one of the next things I want to cover actually is uh, the usage of shorthand and symbols. So uh, as a new player, right, you're going to be exposed to a lot of concepts uh, fairly fast. So one of the things I've noticed in uh, teaching new players is that when you're learning a game, you want to have some sort of shorthand to kind of have new players batch concepts together, but you don't want too many. Otherwise, they'll be overwhelmed with the kind of burden of knowledge to actually understand what cards and what uh, board game pieces are doing. Mm, absolutely. There are, there are so many games that I can think of that have that, <laughs> where they just, they're like a keyword salad, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, you go into this, you know, in a, in a board game, you have a fairly contained experience, right? For mm -hmm. a, a game like Magic, 
I can understand that over the course of time, you know, they, there's hundreds, if not thousands of keywords in Magic, yep. but not many of them are in play at any, in any individual time. But in a board game, it's a fairly contained experience that generally doesn't expand. I mean, obviously, lots of board games do have expansions, but they'll only introduce one or two new keywords. But when I play a game for the first time and I look at a card and I can't understand what a card does just by looking at it and reading it, it really throws me off a little bit. When, it, you know, I'll look at a soldier and it will say, Blast 2, um, Snipe 1, Accuracy 3. You know, I'm like, okay, well, that's now three keywords at a minimum that I have to learn mm-hmm. all on one card. Right, so it's also that density of how often those keywords co- um, exist together. I look at a card and it's got five things I don't understand. It's very different from looking at a card and it having one thing I don't understand. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not just with uh, words either. That's also with symbols. So one of the most recent games that I think uh, has been kind of talked about is Earthborn Rangers. I know, uh, KP, you tried that. Uh, <laughs> and you do have some things to say regarding the usage of symbols there. Why don't oh, you go God. ahead? <laughs> yeah, so Earthborn Rangers. To clarify, I'd like to say that I don't, I don't have a problem with Earthborn Rangers as a game concept. I'm actually really interested in it, and I am a backer on it. But recently, Oliver and I um, actually tried to play through Earthborn Rangers on TTS, and my god, it was pretty messy. The, the main reason for it was that you have these two... So, how do I explain this? Okay, so there are, there are four basic actions in the game. It's, you know, you can move around, you can calm some animals, you can do a bunch of other stuff. To be honest, we didn't get very far into the game. We only got about two turns before we got frustrated and gave up because of all the iconography problems. But the key thing with those basic actions is they have a color associated with them, a color of energy that you can spend. And in addition to that, they also have an icon. So this is going to be slightly incorrect. But as an example, if you were traveling or you're doing something related to movement, you'd spend, say, green energy and you would spend movement icons. Now that kind of follows and you make that makes some level of sense. And that's easy to grasp onto because the foot is such a concrete concept. I know, having played a lot of games, that I can generalize the foot to movement or agility of some kind. Something to do with speed. However, there were quite a few things that got in the way. The first thing was that the green icon and the foot icon could appear independently. So the foot icon could appear with red sometimes. That meant that I had to pay attention to every single little thing on every single card, and I couldn't just instantly go, oh, it's foot, that's green. They didn't have a linked color identity. They were all separate. What that meant was that there were 16 different combinations of skill checks that could exist in the game. If I compare that to Arkham Horror, which only had four, you know, four is much easier to process. And whenever I saw a a head on an Arkham Horror card, I'd go, oh, it's a willpower check. Or if I saw a fist, I'd know, oh, it's a combat check. And they all made consistent sense with the flavor of what I was trying to do. So we'll go into grok ability a little bit later, but it was just much more... It was much simpler for me to understand in Arkham Horror. In Earthborn Rangers, the color combinations, the colors seemed fairly arbitrary, which then meant that it wasn't easy for me to um, understand what color ap- applied when, apart from having to read all of the card over and over again, which then was more taxing. And on top of that, some of the icons that came with the cards just didn't really represent anything. There was one icon that was like a triangle, and it, I had no idea why it was a triangle, but it just meant that I didn't really have any idea of what that was supposed to represent, which then meant that it was harder for me to guess what a particular thing meant, and then there were just icons all over the cut. It was, yeah, it was it was tough. I think that there might be an interesting adventure game there with a great theme, but at the moment, that processing was nearly impossible. It was just very frustrating. And I say that as someone who's played card games for 18 years. I've played every LCG under the sun, um, and I've played, you know, a lot of games at a very competitive level. So it's not like I'm just playing this for the foot, like playing a new game um, and I've never played anything. Like I have a lot of experience and I still, that was probably the most, one of the most challenging board games I've ever had to learn. Oh yeah, definitely. That does sound, well, I haven't played it myself. I am a backer, but uh, yeah, definitely does sound uh, kind of difficult, especially with the color associations. The more abstract yeah. concepts you kind of apply to learning your game or uh, to apply to mechanics to your game, the more you have to rely on a pre-existing knowledge that exists outside of the game to convey your concepts properly. Right? You mentioned the, the foot iconography, where it's pretty easy to associate with movement because you know, everybody associates feet with movement. Yeah, but if it was... Way, I would associate 
Mm-hmm. Sorry, you go. But if it was something a little bit more abstract, like, I don't know, some sort of like gust of wind or something, it might be a little more, way more difficult and that'd be even worse, right? Absolutely. There was a game I played recently called Excavation Earth, which I played because it was on Kickstarter. Um, now, to clarify, I think Excavation Earth is a pretty solid game. I don't know if you'll end up keeping it, but one of the most challenging things in that game is, once again, you have all of these cards that have different colors and different symbols. Not only do the other symbols arbitrary, they don't have any relationship to the thing that they match. So, like, one's a tentacle, one's, like, a weird space icon, and that's the thing. They're not even easy to name, apart from the tentacle. They don't have any relationship to the areas that they actually indicate. So you have to manually look at the icon, then look at the symbol on the board and find it. And the colors are the same. The colors are all just arbitrary, Mm -hmm. in a sense. They, They represent, you know, red represents red, but... There is nothing else that really links those things together. It's just red goes with red. So when you're in, in that game, you have to draft. And so you, you're drafting and you're looking and you're like, well, what does this card even mean? So you, then you have to look at the board and look at the color and look at the symbol and look on where, where the board it matches to. And it's just a processing nightmare. It's really difficult. So a really abstracted symbol, uh, symbology is a big no-no as far as accessibility goes for games. Absolutely. Are there any games that you kind of have played recently, or maybe not so recently, that you think have stood out in terms of good symbology? Ooh, so for good symbology. Let me just have a quick look on my shelf. Yeah. Okay, so I think a really good example of some good iconography um, actually comes in games that have it as a mix, Mm -hmm. right? So a good example, I think, would be Power Rangers Heroes of the Grid, which has been my you know, my, um, <laughs> what is it, my, not shelf of shame, my embarrassed, like, look, I love Power Rangers, <laughs> and it's a fantastic game that I've spent too much money on, um, but I digress, in that it's a cooperative uh, game where you're trying to fight against the bad guys, and you have a hand, a deck of asymmetric cards that are different from each other player. The game has a wide range of effects, which are explained verbally in very simple, very short sentences. And it only uses a few icons, and the icons immediately are immediately recognizable and make sense. So I think the only icons in that game are for dice, for damage, and for energy. And all of those concepts are really easily relatable, even having not been explained. So that's a really good example, I think, of icons mixed with text done right. Yeah, definitely. I think to add to your to add to the list of icons done right. I do enjoy uh, Wingspan's icons. I know um, it's kind of, objectively speaking, it's kind of in the middle, but as somebody who is passively interested in like bird watching, the iconography there is very intensely familiar because it's mostly just like bird-related imagery, which is just their food and <laughs> their eggs. Um, so that's one thing I think that is both thematically interesting and uh, very, I want to say, grokkable. Uh, Mark Rosewater has mentioned this, uh, he's the lead designer for Magic, has mentioned this concept, which is grokkability. In short, it basically means how well a new player can understand a concept as it relates to what is happening within the confines of the world of the game. So in Magic, uh, it's used for conveying uh, kind of miniature stories on cards. For example, a goblin that is very reckless might, be, might have, you know, camp block or must attack. That's very, uh, it's a very grokkable flavor where, okay, he, it's very understandable that he wouldn't be able to block or always attacks because he's so reckless. Uh, and so that kind of applies to using the symbology well. Um, but having your game theme and the concepts within that uh, be understandable to somebody who is, has the knowledge of what is happening in the game, but not necessarily the game itself, uh, that's really important too. Yeah, absolutely. That thematic mechanic integration is really important. A really good theme on a game helps you understand the mechanisms Mm -hmm. and doesn't get in the way. If you have a theme where the worst themes are not necessarily themes that are uninteresting, it's themes that actively work against the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So that can happen sometimes with pasted on themes where they try and explain why something happens and then it just really doesn't work and you have to go through a bunch of mental gymnastics in order to understand it. I was going to mention... Wingspan as a good example, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. um, where you know the, the fact that you collect this food and then it plays birds, it makes sense, right? The birds are attracted to the fact that you have the food, they come along, they eat the food, it goes away. Yep. 
And another, another good thing about the food icons there is they're not just color, but they're also icons, right? Like there, there's a mouse, there's a grub, mm-hmm. there's, I'm trying, there's some uh, berries, I think. Yeah, berries. Yeah, so they, they're more than just a color. They could have just been gray, green, red, etc. But that would have made them harder to relate to, mm-hmm. um, making them actually relate to a real world concept and giving them a separate icon as well as a color just gives you more things to latch on to to actually see that differentiation and they stand out as um, more and more different. Yep, and one thing I think uh, Wingspan does that's pretty uh, pretty important for learning a game is that uh, in particular the food icons, they don't have too much mechanical baggage contained within the icon. It's mostly just cards that uh, you know have effects because you have a food icon on it. Um, Games where you have a symbol that's attached to rules knowledge, that's a that's another big hurdle for new players to jump through because they have to not only associate the icon with the concept that's trying to be portrayed, but also the mechanical uh, implications of that concept. Yeah. So as you said, when, when the icon just refers to, I mean, as you said, the icons in Wingspan don't have any mechanical meaning outside of cards that reference them. Mm-hmm. So that makes it a lot easier to comprehend. And rather than having to say a grub and then having people, oh, okay, which one is the grub? Is it this one or that one? It has just the clear picture, which matches what's on the dice, so it makes it really easy to um, associate. Yep. And for more complex games like Arkham Horror LCG, uh, where you have icons that are stats, but you don't have um, kind of any mechanical baggage to the stats, uh, the icons may indicate a play style or a series of effects, but those are always going to be written out and those are always going to be... Uh, card by card understand, understood within the confines of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm just using another example of a game which has icons which are loaded with actual um, implications within the game. Um, so there's a game, Tapestry, which I quite enjoy by Stonemaier Games, who also did Wingspan, so it's an interesting thing um, in that Stonemaier, Stonemaier Games, I think, tr- have a thing where they try and make their games as language independent as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Wingspan, mostly works, um, although Wingspan does have a fair bit of text on its cards. But in Tapestry, which is almost, almost completely language independent, every single space on the board is just represented by icons. It is a nightmare to learn for the first time. You basically have to have this sheet next to you, which verbally explains every single space on the board. Now, as you go through the game, the icons do make more sense. And over time, that does actually make it easier to understand each of the spaces. But because they're trying to represent such differing concepts on different spaces, there are some icons that only appear once in the entire game. And at that point, why even have an icon? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think one other game that uh, mixes this, I think to its detriment, uh, most people might ignore it, is Spirit Island, where you have icons that are contained within cards that have uh, some mechanical knowledge uh, that's needed to understand them. For example... Uh, all the icons of like the settlers, the cities, and the towns, you have to realize, okay, that's two health, that's three health, so on and so forth. But you also have icons, and these are contained within the expansion, so it's, maybe it's a little forgivable, that have no rules baggage to them, that are simply there and have no effect until a card or effect that you have keys off of it. So this is, I think, the beast and the plant that have no rules, not rules effect inherently. It's... A, it's- it's actually just the beast. The plant does have a, a base rules thing. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. So yeah, just the beast that has no rules effect uh, inherently and relies on the one spirit that, uh, one or two spirits that use it to kind of affect the board and affect, uh, play off of that. Yeah, I, are you saying, just to clarify, are you saying that the beasts are a good part and the other parts are bad? Or I the think beasts that, are bad and the other parts are good? Oh yeah, sorry, I should, I should have clarified. Uh, I think that... Both of them individually are fine, but when you mix the two, there's certain expectations that you have going in that need to be kind of unlearned. So uh, when I first picked up the expansion, my first thought was, okay, beasts, what do they do? Because every other icon that's used in the game has some inherent effect to it. And uh, learning that, okay, it does nothing until another effect says it does, that is a kind of, not really a mental hurdle, but more like a little, you know, like a... um, you kind of have like a right. little average reaction where it's like, oh, okay, that's that's interesting. It is kind of like a mental hurdle, though. It's what it's basically exceptions to the rule. Yeah. Right. 
Like that's that's the key thing. So I agree with you that Spirit Island. I, I played Spirit Island a lot, so I I'm very familiar with all of the different icons in it. But one of the most challenging things about Spirit Island's icons is that all five of them, five in both expansions, um, those five tokens all function very differently. There are two that are similar, mm-hmm. um, but then the other three are different in their own ways. So two of them trigger on these spe- at these specific times, and they are very consistent in what they do. One prevents exploration, one prevents building. Those things make sense. Mm-hmm. One is somewhat similar um, in the sense that it um, gently prevents damage during ravaging, but it doesn't prevent all of the ravage. It only prevents some of it, which mm-hmm. is a bit different. But then beasts and badlands, beasts are passive until interacted with, and badlands actually provide a global effect, which affects the area con- um, constantly. And so because of that, it just makes understanding what the tokens are very challenging. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a... Uh, and fortunately, it's all mostly contained within the expansion, so you have the advantage of having uh, players who are already familiar with the game uh, kind of need to pick up on these concepts rather than players new to the game. Uh, but it is something that um, kind of make, turns me off with the expansions a little bit because there's this weird hurdle that you have to jump through where you have to learn more of the game rather than to get you know more of the game, <laughs> so to speak. There's no yes. There's no twists that are inherent in the rules of the game. You have to add more elements to the rules to make it more uh, to to play these cards. Yeah, it's vertical vertical additions rather than horizontal. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that yes? Wait, hang on. I think I'm it's trying to remember which, which direction we went. No, it, it it's it's sorry, vertical. It, it's, it's vertical. It's horizontal additions rather than vertical because you're adding more yes. rules. Yeah, yeah, you're adding more more variety. Sorry, not more variety. Yeah. So vertical is adding depth to existing things. Mm-hmm. Horizontal is adding complexity. Yeah, yep. sorry. Ge- geometry, spatial stuff, not my strong point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, do you want to kind of go over that really quick? Just vertical versus horizontal expansion? Yeah. Complexity versus depth? Yeah, sure. Sure. So I guess I'll use Terraforming Mars as an example. So Terraforming Mars is a brilliant game, like whenever I'm in my top 10. Um, and it's got a mix of both vertical and horizontal things in it. So by vertical... What I mean is that it adds new things to the game, but the, those new things that are added are only differences, uh, only use existing mechanisms. So, for example, in Terraformers, there is a deck of cards, which is a pre existing mechanism in the game. And an expansion comes out and adds cards to that deck, and those cards all use the same base mechanisms that existed in the core game, then that does not add any horizontal complexity. It simply adds depth, which is good. When an expansion adds horizontal things, that means it's introducing new game concepts. So as an example, um, in Terraforming Mars, in the, I think it's the third expansion, there's so many, it adds this whole idea of colonies. Colonies have their own unique rule set. They come with cards which interact with them, but they could fundamentally change the game and add more to it. That is a horizontal expansion because it doesn't, it doesn't just enhance something that already existed. It adds more. Now, to clarify, there's nothing that's inherently bad about a horizontal expansion versus a vertical one. But horizontal expansions increase complexity, whereas vertical ones do not. So the more horizontal expansions or the more horizontal content you have in a game, the more challenging it is to teach that game. Yeah, and this is especially true with board games where you need to be able to p- teach the game in a sufficient amount of time where somebody who is completely new to the game and pick up the game and play with people who are experienced and have a relatively good time with it. Compared to other games which are kind of, you were expected to invest more time in it, like uh, trading card games, uh, mm. having horizontal expansion, uh, especially contained within expansions, is, uh, seems to be the way to go because that allows people who, have, who are more experienced with the game to have more fun while still keeping the simpler options to the newer players. I've noticed that a lot of uh, board games will tend to do both, where the first expansion might not introduce any new concepts and just be, you know, additional cards to add to the deck or, you know, additional, like, factions or that don't really add anything and just have a little, a slightly different playstyle that plays off of a different aspect of the core game. Uh, but later on, usually second, second or third expansion, they'll be adding additional parts, additional, you know, components to the game that either kind of ramp up complexity or ramp up uh, certain parts of the game to expand upon that concept yeah and i think a a key thing as well is just how much 
horizontal complexity something introduces and how contained it is. Mm -hmm. So let's take let's take Spirit Island as an example, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the spirits in Spirit Island within the expansions basically could be played within the core game, right? They don't add any new concepts whatsoever. Yep. S some do add new concepts. I'm thinking uh, I can't remember his name. Um, I'd butcher it if I tried to say it, but he's something something about dawn and time or something like that. Mm -hmm. but he in, he introduces a, a mechanic that only affects him. So the key thing there is that, yes, it's a horizontal mechanism technically. It adds something completely new to the game, but it only increases the complexity for him. Now, one of the key things about that is that Spirit Island is a cooperative game, so other players don't necessarily need to understand that as much. However, if you introduce a new faction to an asymmetric you know, area control or combat game, and that new, uh, new faction has mechanisms that everyone is going to interact with, and all of a sudden everyone needs to understand that more. And so it's also just understanding that horizontal complexity is not always a simple concept. It's just thinking about how much does that new complexity um, impact what players need to think about in the game. That's really the key. Exactly. I think this is where a lot of uh, kind of card games where you have a variety of deck types that you have to learn and you have to kind of play with, that's where they might fail in picking up new players. I'll use Magic as an example, but I can also use it for Fab, where, uh, you know, if you just play with a single set of Magic, you usually have like maybe 10 to 12 different archetypes of decks that you might face that in, you know, a block constructed or a limited format. So that's pretty easy to learn. You know, you know what each deck does. Usually around the time that you have a, a couple of lands out and you, the opponent has played a couple cards. As the game kind of complexity increases by adding more cards and more deviant strategies to it, for example, say modern, then you have issues where new players might have might be exposed to concepts that are so wildly different from what they understand the game to be that it may turn them off. Of course, some players might react positively and be like, oh, wow, you can do that. But uh, for a lot of players, I think there's a hurdle of, well, that doesn't seem fair, or well, that doesn't seem right, or well, that doesn't seem balanced, or actually, can you actually do that? Where, say, a deck, for example, Storm, might be like, huh, that's really interesting. I never thought about it like that, like that. And it's the extra learning of the minutia of the game systems that the decks are kind of building around. That's going to be a big hurdle for new player onboarding. Absolutely. And a key thing in TCGs is that idea that everything does matter, right? If you're trying to compete and TCGs have a thing where most people are trying to compete. So really we're mm -hmm. talking about like barriers to playing well as well, right? So a new player being able to come on board and play a game well. And when we, I'll take Fab as an example. So if you're playing Fab, let's say you were playing just the core set. I think the core set design was absolutely magnificent. Mm -hmm. Every single character in the core set follows us some pretty clear rules Sure, they, the way they work is a little bit different, but overall, they play attack cards, they attack each other, they hit with weapons. That's pretty much what all the core set heroes do. But let's jump forward three sets to Monarch, and let's look at Prism as an example. So Prism all of a sudden has all of these attack actions, but Prism also has instant things which come into play and stay into play. She has Soul, which is a completely new concept. She has these shields which prevent damage. Like There are so many more concepts that get introduced by Prism that just didn't exist in the core set. So mm -hmm. if someone had only played Welcome to Welcome to Wraith, and then they jumped in and were fighting against Prism, every single thing that they think about the game is fundamentally flipped. Yep. The other thing as well about Prism, specifically, is the, um, the interaction of illusions um, and auras and go again, mm -hmm. which is not something that is inherent. Like, it doesn't... It's, does not, it's not intuitive mm -hmm. that if you attack into something like an aura, that your go again doesn't trigger. It does have reminder text, which is useful. That does help uh, players remember, or at least has reminder text on some of them. But it's still not something that's intuitive. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying this is bad either, because uh, these sorts of additional strategies that arise from you know just expansion of cards do help a lot in player retention. But for every new set that's added, you have to, uh, for a new player to achieve kind of basic literacy within the meta game, they have to learn that. So it's kind of a double-edged sword where you want to int introduce new concepts and new heroes to keep the players interested and keep them learning the game. Uh, but you also have to make sure that the new player can easily understand and easily uh, kind of see what 
other their opponent is doing in any given game that they may face in an you know introductory event or in some other event. And this yeah, is the, this absolutely. is separate from board games too, right? Because board games usually you play one or two one game a week usually, or maybe you play a game like once every month or so something. So you don't have to have um, you can't have too much concepts uh, kind of drip fed to you. You have to have you have to understand the entire game within the in the one session that you're playing. Whereas with uh, trading card games, you can kind of drift feed that and have them learn over a series of multiple games spanning multiple days or multiple weeks. Absolutely. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, kind of uh, the challenges that we face as uh, teachers versus designers, because I think we've gone a bit into designing for new players. But uh, mm -hmm. what about for teachers? What's the, what do you think is one of the bigger hurdles to explaining a game and teaching a game to a, to a player? Well, I'm someone who's taught games to hundreds of people, so I'm always the game teacher, and I prefer it that way, um, mainly because I've had a few questionable experiences with other people teaching. I know that makes me sound horrible, <laughs> but it's just the reality of it is I've just had quite a few games which could be good ruined for me because, oh, whoops, because um, someone explained one critical rule wrong. But I think one of the key differences between designing for new players and explaining a game for new players is on what you focus on right mm -hmm. so one recent innovation that i've seen a few um people teaching games um use is actually explaining strategy as they teach right so it depends on how you want to get the players on board some players don't like this some players would rather discover but as a teacher rather than a designer designers have to kind of intuitively or sorry make it so that learning the game is intuitive whereas teachers can make it so that they can be much more explicit about what's good in the game. So as an example, I played a game recently that's currently under development, so I won't say the name, um, but the person demoing the game actually explained some pretty key points. They said, you need this in the game. If you don't get this, you will not win the game. Um, and I, I do that for, I've done that previously for some games where I think it's essential, like literally it's a make or break of the game. But when there's a bit more to discover in the game or it's not as essential, I don't really mention it, even if it's quite a strong thing to do. So I think one of the key differences, as I said, with a teacher versus a designer is a teacher can choose to really emphasize particular parts of the game, mm -hmm. whereas designers cannot necessarily. Yeah, I've seen uh, designers try to kind of band-aid that where they have sections of the rulebook dedicated to, say, to giving you tips and advice on how to play like the first session of the game. Uh, this is for, you know, games that are generally more complex and have a lot of moving parts and concepts. Yeah, definitely as a teacher, you have to be able to explain to new players how to have a good time rather than how to play the game. Because I think a lot of how a lot of new player sessions go is that they'll make inevitably make rules mistakes. And some of them may be benign. Maybe they just forget I don't know, some sort of like trigger. Maybe they just forget to do something in the proper order. And for the most part, it's not really necessary to correct them. Uh, you know, you want to correct them eventually, but you want to make sure that they are enjoying the game, and you don't want you don't, you don't want them you don't want them to get too bogged down with the minutia of rules because that will just be a negative mm -hmm. experience for them. So, as a teacher, I think, yeah, definitely one of the things is that uh, to explain concepts in a way that will enable them to enjoy their first playthrough. This is especially true for board games, uh, but perhaps maybe for trading card games as well, where they have to. They want to, you want to have them enjoy their first few games so they play some more. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, it's a really tricky thing as, a, you know, as someone who is designing a board game at the moment. It's really tricky because the, I have to almost design a game assuming that a teacher at, on the first game will not do an excellent job. I know that sounds weird, but by that I mean I try and design a game in a sense that no matter what, your first game will be enjoyable. But it's really tricky when you're designing for depth because it could just be the case that some things are just much trickier to learn about. And if you don't understand concepts of the game, then, you know, you won't have an excellent time. So there are a few different things I've tried to do with that. Um, Root is an example of a game that tries to do that by walking the players through the first few turns. And I've taken a little bit out of that book, but I don't like that. I don't love it because of how artificial it kind of seems. Yeah, it feels like you're just following an instruction booklet rather than actually like learning how to play the game. You're kind of going through that mandatory tutorial at the beginning of a video game where you have to, okay, beat this wave of enemies using this ability. That's how you learn. 
Yeah, that's right. And people generally, I think, hate tutorials. So <laughs> it's the role of a teacher is really important in that as, not only are they explaining the rules of the game, they're also actually providing almost a tutorial of how to play the game really quickly. Yeah. And it's done from hopefully a friendly uh, perspective rather than a you know mechanical, faceless perspective that you can provide as a designer. So hopefully the player should respond more positively to that. One would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it's it's not always the case, but you know, it's better. It's you're better off taking the gamble with the teacher, right? Absolutely. So, uh, what are some games that you think have uh, done, not necessarily, um, you know, done the tutorial well, but made it easy for players for teach teachers to teach the game? Anything that comes to mind? Ooh. Ooh. This is a pretty hard co- question because it's. Hard to see games yeah. from the perspective of a teacher because you're usually only teaching the game maybe like 5% of the time you're playing it. So Yeah, that's right. I'm trying to think of some that do that really well and just make it really intuitive and really easy. Um, I was going to say, shameless self-plug. Um, I feel like I do a pretty good job of teaching Food Chain Magnet. Um, and the way I do that is kind of just playing through a tutorial turn, but that's not, that's not the question I'm aware mm-hmm. Um what is a game that teaches itself really well? So I'll actually mention the yeah. game that I think teaches itself really yeah. well. Uh, Arkham Horror LCG, it has the advantage of being a living card game, so you can introduce uh, very simple scenarios and concepts and then add promise complexity later and have players buy into that. But uh, for those of you who don't know, Arkham Horror LCG is a cooperative uh, kind of card game where you all play the role of some sort of uh, role of a typical investigator in a horror movie, and you have to deal with whatever you know is affecting them and get make it out all alive or solve whatever issue is at hand. And I feel like for a lot of players, they usually start off with the first scenario, the gathering, which is a incredibly simple scenario, almost like a tutorial for a video game, but does teach concepts relatively well and at a relatively low intensity and low stakes pace. Uh, I believe the first scenario has you escaping out of your house that is you know, slowly turning into some sort of weird horror dimension. And the first task of the first scenario is just to exit your room. And it's got a couple of very simple tests that once you read the rules, you understand, and then you can uh, start applying that to new concepts. But it doesn't feel forced in that you're still free to do whatever you want within that space until you actually you know, run out of time or until you're, you know, decide to move on to the next room. Yeah, okay, I've got a game now. <laughs> Throughout all that time, I was thinking of a game and I was looking around. So, Micro Macro Crime City is actually a really good example, and I think people would, some people might question whether it's a game or not, but for reference, Micro Macro Crime City is almost like well, Where's Wally for Adults. In it, um, you're basically doing this puzzle on a, on a map, and you're trying to determine what happened um, in a particular, for what led to a particular crime occurring, and answering a couple of different questions. It has um, a difficulty rating for the scenarios, and the early scenarios introduce concepts which are then really important for later scenarios. So the idea that you know you might want to follow someone in a car, you might want to pay attention to these different things, you might want to you know take a closer look at different things that are around them. They kind of open your eyes to all these different things that might be important in later cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think you touched on a small aspect I want to kind of dig into, which is. Uh priming the 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 new player and or the teacher to be in a certain mindset so that game concepts come easier to them i think the escape rooms uh, this is more abstractly you know a game but escape rooms no but this is a good good yeah. example uh escape rooms are a really good one because you come into an escape room expecting puzzles so whenever you're um, confronted with something that doesn't immediately like present itself at with a solution you think, okay, what is the designer? Where, what are they trying to make me think here? And you come into the room with a mindset that you're, you're going to be solving puzzles. So I think as the designer, the biggest thing you want to do, and this is accomplished usually with theme or with some other mechanical priming that you have in the rule book, is that you want to you know, convey to the player, this is what you want to be thinking about when you play the game. Therefore, and then make your own decisions based off of that. Another, I think 
what is really common about all of these different games that we're talking about is that within those games they there are they have a series of puzzles mm-hmm. or they have different missions so that makes it much easier because you can make tutorial missions or pseudo tutorial missions without making them feel like a tutorial mm-hmm. there's actually a computer game called Bubba is you um, mm-hmm. yep that's a good one. I, don't, I don't know if you've played it but it has a really good example where early on it teaches you a couple of game concepts very organically and very naturally which mm-hmm. you then use to solve puzzles later on so it's Really, really clever. Yeah, a lot of That's puzzle games game. really lean on lean on to this concept. Not only Baba's You, but you know, just any sort of pro- problem solving game, uh, like the Zachtronic series, do have these sorts of like, here's a introduction of a concept with a simple puzzle. Now apply that to a bigger, con- bigger, bigger puzzle. Okay. Now let's make it harder. Now let's apply it in a different way. Exactly. So, and yeah. so, how would we apply this to a game where it is competitive and or doesn't have the benefit of having individualized, you know, submissions that you can do to accomplish something. That's a big question. How would you do it? Well, normally what I try and do when I teach games is I try and introduce the core concepts in a very natural way. Mm-hmm. So as an example, I'll just use Fab because I assume most listeners who are listening to this um, would have played Fab before. Mm-hmm. Um, I would introduce the concept of paying costs. like, And I wouldn't explicitly talk about it. I would just say, I'm playing this card. You know, It costs me this much so i pitch this card to do that mm-hmm. you know and i can see it has two icons there and that con- that solves it i guess it is kind of explicit but i'm not spending a lot bunch of time to just explain every individual mechanism i'm doing it in context as soon as i can yep while still providing that explanation on top exactly and since you have the benefit of using the card text later on to explain you know the more complex concepts you can just basically convey the game rules as the skeleton of how you play the game and then use the cards themselves as a way to add the depth that you need to convey to it, right? I notice a lot 100%. of players do this, where they they will do the thing, the thing that you do, which is, I play this card paying X cost, and they very explicitly will say, okay, I'll pitch this to pay for this. And I think that's a really good way for players to naturally onboard themselves, where they get into the habits and they get into the mindset of like understanding the core game concepts. So that later on, when they get more experience with the game, that thing comes at second nature to them. Okay. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult topic, I think, because there's not many there's games... There's so much to tackle in it. Yeah, there's not many games that kind of are universally applicable because there's so many you know, different concepts for games. I think we've been mostly talking about, talking about puzzle games for this, this part. Um, mm. But I think it's an interesting one because that a lot of competitive games might need to solve because I've noticed that for competitive games rather than uh, cooperative games, they usually have, especially in groups that aren't you know, as uh, entrenched into board game culture, uh, they usually have one or two players that are only casually interested, that might not be having a good time, uh, that might not understand the concepts and are just there basically going through the motions. Yeah, 100%. And so that that's the that's one of the big things I I had you know as a college as a college student you know playing board games where you often had a group that was only casually interested in playing board games so usually some one or one or two people who didn't like the concept of the game would be sitting on the sidelines just you know first one out or you know whatever and uh, be like okay cool and then proceed not to uh, not to mention the game again and just not want to play the game again because they didn't enjoy their first time with it I think making sure that you know. 10% or 12% of players that don't, that usually are that type of player and making sure that they enjoy it, that's going to be the biggest hurdle and that's going to be the biggest challenge that a lot of games like this face. Absolutely. Kind of finish off on something that's actually why I think that having simple, really straightforward things in games are really critical. So as an example, I would say that playing Modern Red in Magic is much more straightforward than playing more higher, more higher interactive decks. Mm-hmm. Right? You're basically just trying to go for face and get them down to 20 as quickly as possible. That, but they're still effective, right? They yeah. still can compete and still perform. So they actually serve a really important purpose in allowing newer players to be able to access the game on a competitive level and dip their toes in while still feeling like they can, you know, compete. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's where um, the complexity rating on some of the Spirit and Spirit Island do come into play as really helpful because I can give a new player, okay, pick one of these low complexity spirits that seem good. And the new player can see, oh, this spirit is high complexity. I don't want to play this guy because I don't want to think too much. Mm -hmm. Having the player be able to 
tailor their experience to their interest level in the game, or not really interest level, but like, you know, uh, engagement level of the game is really important. Yeah, too. Invest, investment level, I guess. Yeah. Okay, cool. Anything else you want to cover? No, I, I think that's it. My brain is currently fried from all of this thinking as well. I know, right? But, uh, yeah. So uh, I think later on we'll be going over a couple more concepts relating to board games in general, not just fab. Uh, but this is kind of just a kind of a test run for seeing how many how many people how many of you guys enjoy this content and want to hear more of it, and uh, how much you think our opinion is I don't know, worth listening to. I, I don't think we ever make any claims that our opinions are worth listening to, but you know, might as well just uh, ask you guys, right? Absolutely. You drive our content. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, see you guys next week then, or I guess whenever we are able to record. I know this uh, these podcasts have been, haven't been particularly regular, but we'll try and do what we can. Catch you guys later. All right. See ya.